A specter is haunting Iran. The specter of imperialist war. Welcome to the Red Canon. I'm Vinny McLean. Red Canon is a project bringing audiobooks of classic leftist literature to the working class. This isn't really episode two, it's more one and a half. Episode two will still be reform and revolution, it's just that events have caught up with me. I felt it necessary to read something with a distinct anti-imperialist, anti-war bent. This piece, written by Lenin, scratches that itch. It was published in the Social Democrat, an underground newspaper in Tsarist Russia that Lenin edited. Here, Lenin defends revolutionary defeatism. It was the idea that, in losing the world war, the Russian ruling class would be weakened and make revolution possible. You can make up your own decision on how this one went. It also shows, well, we sure as hell don't need Twitter to be catty to one another. As always, Red Cannon is a small part of a larger, ongoing political education project. For more information, visit patreon.com slash socialismisgood. This work is pulled from the Marxists' Internet Archive at Marxists.org. The Defeat of One's Own Government in the Imperialist War by V.I. Lenin During a reactionary war, a revolutionary class cannot but desire the defeat of its own government. A revolutionary class cannot but desire the defeat of its government. This is axiomatic and disputed only by conscious partisans or helpless satellites of the social chauvinists. Among the former, for instance, is Semkovsky of the Organizing Committee, number two of its Izvestia, and among the latter, Trotsky and Buk Voyed, and Kautsky in Germany. To desire Russia's defeat, Trotsky writes, is an uncalled for and absolutely unjustifiable concession to the political methodology of social patriotism, which would replace the revolutionary struggle against the war and the conditions causing it with an orientation highly arbitrary in the present conditions toward the lesser evil. This is an instance of high-flown phraseology with which Trotsky always justifies opportunism. A revolutionary struggle against the war is merely an empty and meaningless exclamation, something at which the heroes of the Second International excel, unless it means revolutionary action against one's own government, even in wartime. One only has to do some thinking in order to understand this. Wartime revolutionary action against one's own government indubitably means not only desiring its defeat, but really facilitating such a defeat. Discerning reader. Note that this does not mean blowing up bridges, organizing unsuccessful strikes in the war industries, and in general helping the government defeat the revolutionaries. The phrase bandying Trotsky has completely lost his bearings on a simple issue. It seems to him to desire Russia's defeat means desiring the victory of Germany. Book Voyed and Semkovsky give more direct expression to this thought, or rather want of thought, which they share with Trotsky. But Trotsky regards this as methodology of social patriotism. To help people that are unable to think for themselves, the Byrne Resolution, Social Democrat number 40, I made it clear that in all imperialist countries, the proletariat must now desire the defeat of its own government. Book Voyed and Trotsky preferred to avoid this truth, while Semkovsky, an opportunist who is more useful to the working class than all the others, thanks to his naively frank reiteration of bourgeois wisdom, blurted out the following. This is nonsense, because either Germany or Russia can win, in Vestia number 2. Take the example of the Paris Commune. France was defeated by Germany, but the workers were defeated by Bismarck and theirs. Had Bukvoyed and Trotsky done a little thinking, they would have realized that they have adopted the viewpoint on the war held by the governments and the bourgeoisie, i.e. that they cringe to the political methodology of social patriotism, to use Trotsky's pretentious language. A revolution in wartime means civil war. The conversion of a war between governments into a civil war is, on the other hand, facilitated by military reverses, defeats, of government. On the other hand, one cannot actually strive for such a conversion without thereby facilitating defeat. The reason that the chauvinists repudiate the defeat slogan is that this slogan alone implies a consistent call for revolutionary action against one's own government in wartime. Without such action, millions of ultra-revolutionary phrases such as a war against the war and the conditions, etc., are not worth a brass farthing. Anyone who would in all earnest refute the slogan of defeat for one's own government in the imperialist war should prove one of three things. One, that the war of 1914-15 is not reactionary. Or two, that a revolution stemming from that war is impossible. Or three, that the coordination and mutual aid are possible between revolutionary movements in all the belligerent countries. The third point is particularly important to Russia, a most backward country, where an immediate socialist revolution is impossible. That is why the Russian Social Democrats have had first to advance the theory and practice of the defeat slogan, 
the Tsarist government was perfectly right in asserting that the agitation conducted by the Russian Social Democratic Labor Group in the Duma, the sole instance in the International, not only of parliamentary opposition but of genuine revolutionary anti-government agitation among the masses, that this agitation has weakened Russia's military might and that is likely to lead to its defeat. This is a fact to which it is foolish to close one's eyes. The opponents of the defeat slogan are simply afraid of themselves when they refuse to recognize the very obvious fact of the inseparable link between revolutionary agitation against government and helping bring about its defeat. Are coordination and mutual aid possible between the Russian movement, which is revolutionary in the bourgeois democratic sense, and the socialist movements in the West? No socialist who has publicly spoken on the matter during the last decade has doubted this. The movement among the Austrian proletariat after October 17, 1905 actually proving it possible. Editor's note. This refers to the Tsar's manifesto promulgated on October 17, 1905. It promised civil liberties and legislative Duma. The manifesto was a concession wrested from the Tsarist regime by the revolution, but that concession by no means decided the fate of the revolution as the liberals and Mensheviks claimed. The Bolsheviks exposed the real meaning of the manifesto and called upon the masses to continue the struggle and overthrow the autocracy. The first Russian revolution exerted a great revolutionizing influence on the working class movement in other countries, in particular in Austria-Hungary. Lenin pointed out that the news about the Tsar's concession and his manifesto, with its promises of liberties, played a decisive part in the final victory of universal suffrage in Austria. Mass demonstrations took place in Vienna and other industrial cities in Austria-Hungary. In Prague, barricades were put up, as a result, universal suffrage was introduced in Austria. Ask any social democrat who calls himself an internationalist whether or not he approves of an understanding between the social democrats of various belligerent countries on joint revolutionary action against all belligerent governments. Many of them will reply that it is impossible, as Kautsky has done, thereby proving his social chauvinism. This, on the one hand, is a deliberate and vicious lie which clashes with the generally known facts in the Basley Manifesto. On the other hand, if this were true, the opportunists would be quite right in many respects. Many will voice their approval of such an understanding. To this we say, if this approval is not hypocritical, it is ridiculous to think that in wartime, for the conduct of a war, some formal understanding is necessary, such as the election of representatives, the arrangements of a meeting, the signing of an agreement, the choice of the day and hour. Only the Semkovskys are capable of thinking so. An understanding on revolutionary action even in a single country, to say nothing of a number of countries, can be achieved only by the force of the example of serious revolutionary action, by launching such action and developing it. However, such action cannot be launched without desiring the defeat of the government, and without contributing to such a defeat. The conversion of the imperialist war into a civil war cannot be made any more than a revolution can be made. It develops out of the number of diverse phenomena, aspects, features, characteristics, and consequences of the imperialist war. That development is impossible without a series of military reverses and defeats of governments that receive blows from their own oppressed classes. To repudiate the defeat slogan means allowing one's revolutionary ardor to degenerate into an empty phrase or sheer hypocrisy. What is the substitute proposed for the defeat slogan? It is that of neither victory nor defeat. Semkovsky in Investia No. 2 also the entire organizing committee in number one. This, however, is nothing but a paraphrase of the defense of the fatherland slogan. It means shifting the issue to the level of the war between governments, who, according to the content of this slogan, are to keep to their old stand, retain the positions, and not to the level of the struggle of the oppressed classes against the governments. It means justifying the chauvinism of all the imperialist nations, whose bourgeoisie are always ready to say, and do say to the people, that they are only fighting against defeat. The significance of our August 4 vote was that we are not for war, but against defeat. David, a leader of the opportunists, writes in his book, The Organizing Committee, together with Bukvoyed and Trotsky, stand on fully the same ground as David when they defend the neither victory nor defeat slogan. On closer examination, this slogan will be found to mean a class truce the renunciation of the class struggle by the oppressed classes in all the belligerent countries, since the class struggle is impossible without dealing blows to one's own bourgeoisie, one's own government, whereas dealing a blow at one's own government in wartime is, for Bukvoyed's information, high treason means contributing to the defeat of one's own country. Those who accept the neither victory nor defeat slogan can only be hypocritically in favor of the class struggle of disrupting the class truce. In practice, 
Such people are renouncing an independent proletarian policy because they subordinate the proletariat of all belligerent countries to the absolute bourgeois task of safeguarding the imperialist governments against defeat. The only policy of actual nonverbal disruption of the class truce, of acceptance of the class struggle, is for the proletariat to take advantage of the difficulties experienced by its own government and its bourgeoisie in order to overthrow them. This, however, cannot be achieved or striven for without desiring the defeat of one's own government and without contributing to that defeat. When, before the war, the Italian Social Democrats raised the question of a mass strike, the bourgeoisie replied, no doubt correctly from their own point of view, that this would be high treason and that the Social Democrats would be dealt with as traitors. This is true, just as it is true that fraternization in the trenches is high treason. Those who write against high treason as Bukvoya does, or against the disintegration of Russia as Semkovsky does, are adopting the bourgeois, not the proletarian, point of view. A proletarian cannot deal a class blow at his government or hold out, in fact, a hand to his brother, the proletarian of a foreign country, which is at war with our side, without committing high treason, without contributing to the defeat, to the disintegration of his own imperialist great power. Whoever is in favor of the slogan, neither victory nor defeat, is consciously or unconsciously a chauvinist. At best, he is a conciliatory petty bourgeois, but in any case he is an enemy to proletarian policy, a partisan of the existing governments of the present-day ruling classes. Let us look at the question from yet another angle. The war cannot but evoke among the masses the most turbulent sentiments, which upset the usual sluggish state of mass mentality. Revolutionary tactics are impossible if they are not adjusted to these new turbulent sentiments. What are the main currents of these turbulent sentiments? They are, one, horror and despair, hence a growth of religious feeling. Again, the churches are crowded. The reactionaries joyfully declare, wherever there is suffering, there is religion. Wherever there is suffering, there is religion, says the arc reactionary bars. He is right, too. Two, hatred of the enemy, a sentiment that is carefully fostered by the bourgeoisie, not so much by the priests. Arid is of economic and political value only to the bourgeoisie. Three, hatred of one's own government and one's own bourgeoisie, the sentiment of all class-conscious workers who understand, on the one hand, that war is a continuation of the politics of imperialism, which they counter by a continuation of their hatred of the class enemy. On the other hand, that a war against war is a banal phrase unless it means a revolution against their own government. Hatred against one's own government and one's own bourgeoisie cannot be aroused unless the defeat is desired. One cannot be a sincere opponent of civil truce without arousing hatred of one's own government and bourgeoisie. Those who stand for the neither victory nor defeat slogan are in fact on the side of the bourgeoisie and the opportunists, for they do not believe in the possibility of international revolutionary action by the working class against their own governments, and they do not wish to help develop such action, which, though undoubtedly difficult, is the only task worthy of a proletarian, the only socialist task. It is the proletariat in the most backward of the belligerent great powers which, through the medium of their party, have had to adopt, especially in view of the shameful treachery of the German and French social democrats, revolutionary tactics that are quite unfeasible unless they contribute to the defeat of their own government, but which alone lead to a European revolution, to the permanent peace of socialism, to the liberation of humanity from the horrors, misery, savagery, and brutality now prevailing. All right, I just wanted to get that one off my chest. I had this on my mind for no particular reason. I remember the run-up to the Iraq War when I was young. It was obvious that the media, the government, the whole ruling class wanted the war, and they weren't going to take no for an answer. The revulsion liberals have for Trump helps, to an extent, but the ruling class loves war more than liberals pretend to love peace. Marches and rallies may help get some of your energy out, but I suspect organizing Raytheon workers so they won't build machines to murder children might be a little more effective.